You're listening to a podcast from the University of Manchester. Hello and welcome to The Buzz, a University of Manchester podcast about all things science and engineering here in the city of Manchester. Each episode will be shining a light on some of the research happening here, how it was influenced by the city's past and how it will shape the future. We'll celebrate the university's heroes, both past and present, legends like Alan Turing, Jocelyn Belbonnell, Ernest Rutherford and Brian Cox. We'll also chart its greatest achievements, like the isolation of graphene and the development of the first computer. And we'll meet with the scientists and engineers who work here today, what are they working on? Why does it matter to them? And how will it impact the world? In this episode, we take a look at the renaissance of Manchester's textile industry through the birth of fast fashion. This is a sector whose influence on the fashion industry can be seen everywhere, from the struggling high streets to the luxury fashion houses. After all, how can you compete with a brand that can deliver the outfit you've seen on Instagram that morning to your door in less than 24 hours, and for less than the price of most university textbooks? There's no doubt fast fashion will have come to the rescue for one or two of you this festive season, whether you're having a panic over your Christmas party outfit or you needed a last minute gift. And Manchester is home to some of the biggest and best known fast fashion brands operating in the UK today. This is a city that was built in the heat of the 19th century textile boom. 100 years later, Manchester blazed a trail for catalogue shopping. With the advent of the internet, it was only natural Manchester would be at the forefront of the fast fashion revolution. But at what cost does this success come? Later, I meet with doctors Patsy Perry and Amy Benstead to dive into the murky waters of fashion's dark side. I'll also be chatting to fashion business graduate Rachel Cox about what the future holds for the sector. But first, my colleagues Joe and Natalie take us back to the time of the Industrial Revolution to chart Manchester's fashion ascent. So can you tell us a little bit about how Manchester started as the centre of the cotton industry? Yep, so Manchester was the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century. Um, in 1870, it was dubbed Cottonopolis. Um, this was because it was the centre of a cotton and weaving industry uh, that served the world. Um, in fact, at one point, around 80% of the world's imported cough was, was produced here. Um, Trading halls were the big commercial centres of Cottonopolis. Um, perhaps the best example of that is the was the Royal Exchange. Uh, this is situated close to St Anne's Square. Um, around 11,000 cotton merchants would meet there every Tuesday and Friday to trade. Um, the building was heavily damaged both during the Manchester Blitz in World War II and in the 1996 Manchester bombing. Uh, the building, of course, now is the home to the Royal Exchange Theatre. What about the name Warehouse City? Where did that come from? In addition to Cottonopolis, uh, Manchester also adopted another nickname. Uh, that was Warehouse City um, in the second half of the 1800s. And um, this was due to a really big increase in warehouses that was built in the city to support the cotton trade. Um, they first appeared on King Street before spreading to places like Portland Street, Whitworth Street and Mosley Street. Um, among these warehouses were what were called packing warehouses. And these were particularly tall and ornate mil buildings such as Asia House, India House and Velvet House. Uh, these are located not too far from the university's own Sackville Street building. Um, and the packing houses, packing warehouses really formed the backbone of Cottonopolis. And how did they receive all the goods? Yeah, so uh, in the 1800s, Manchester became a really important transport hub. Um, this was made possible by a few things, um, including the opening of the Bridgewater Canal. This meant that raw cotton could be imported from the West Indies and the United States via Liverpool, um, and coal came from Worsley as well. Also, the Liverpool and Manchester Railway opened in 1830, uh, and with this improved railway network, uh, Manchester became more connected uh, throughout the northwest. And can we still see any evidence of Cottonopolis around Manchester today? Yep, there's lots of evidence of it. Um, probably most notably in the buildings, uh, particularly in the Northern Quarter and Ancoats, uh, two areas that are now known as the more trendy parts of Manchester, um, in Ancoats in particular. 
there's quite a few old mills which are now being turned into luxury apartments. Um, also in pubs such as the Grey Horse on Portland Street and the Vine on Kennedy Street. Um, these were once weavers' cottages. And if you look closely at the second floor windows, they're quite distinctive. They're quite large and this was to maximize the light that came in. Also, the Great Northern, which is now a big kind of leisure complex with restaurants, cinema, uh, even axe throwing, I think. Um, this place, this huge brick building, this tied together the city's road, rail and canal networks back in the 1800s. Uh, also, Castlefield Basin, uh, which is now a place where music gigs and other events take place. This was the, the terminus of the Bridgewater Canal and the Museum of Science and Industry. This was originally the um, original Manchester station building for the uh, Liverpool and Manchester Railway. And has Manchester always been such a trend-setting city? Yep, uh, plenty of trends have kind of been set in Manchester down the years. Uh, one of the most uh, obvious was the Manchester scene of the late 1980s. I uh, think baggy pants, bucket hats um, and bands such as the Stone Roses and the Happy Mondays. Uh, also, Manchester has a history of kind of promoting independent shops, uh, especially in boutiques throughout the Northern Quarter. Um, perhaps the most well-known is Affleck Palace, which has uh, been a place where people have been buying alternative and vintage clothes for decades. Um, and of course, all the big name shops can be found throughout Manchester in places like the Arndale Centre and the, the Trafford Centre. And what about the rise, um, the huge rise in online shopping? Yep, so Manchester's uh, a really big player in online shopping. Uh, it's actually the UK's largest technology hub outside London. Um, a lot of big name e-commerce brands have set up shop here. Um, with the advent of digital technology has come fast fashion, uh, which we're obviously going to talk about in more detail in, later in this podcast. Uh, fast fashion has many advantages for the consumer, such as uh, being able to order clothes cheaply and uh, having them delivered quickly. Um, but there's also many disadvantages uh, in relation to things like the environment, waste and exploitation, uh, which again, we'll look at in more detail later. Um, what role does the university play in fashion? Yep, so today the university offers, offers a range of fashion business and technology courses. Uh, we have lots of experts in the field which we'll, we'll feature in the podcast later. Um, but the university also has a very rich history when it comes to uh, fashion and materials in particular, such as during World War I, we developed new ways to test aircraft fabric. Um, during World War II, we developed new, uh, new materials for barrage balloons and parachutes. Um, and throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, there's been huge advancements made at the university, such as the development of artificial intelligence, uh, modern computing, chemical engineering. Uh, today, of course, we're leading the way with graphene. Um, this was isolated at Manchester in 2004. It's the world's first 2D material. Uh, it's being used for all kinds of things, including it's being used in running shoes, uh, race cars, and there's lots of big plans for it moving forward. It's a good example of us trying to produce materials that are stronger and lighter and more sustainable. Importantly as well, the, the new Manchester Engineering Campus Development, or MCD as it's also known, is going to be the new home of engineering at Manchester and promises to be a, a real centre of innovation. The site where this is being built was the former site of the Manchester Materials Science Centre, which was the former home of the Department of Materials. And this is a a really good example of the university building on its proud heritage in order to shape the future. Fashionistas have never had it better and there's really never been a more convenient time to shop. If you spot an outfit you love while you're scrolling through your Instagram account one night, you could have it delivered to your door the next day for less than the price of a cup of coffee. Is it any wonder we're now more likely to have a bag for life than a dress for life? I'm Hayley Cox, and I work here at the Faculty of Science and Engineering. As the British high street declines, online retailers continue to grow. Fast fashion is getting faster as retailers compete, and all the while prices are getting lower. 
I sat down with Dr. Patsy Perry and Dr. Amy Benstead from the Department of Materials to learn more about the dark side of the rise of fast fashion. But before we get to that, what exactly is fast fashion? I asked Patsy to explain. Cheap and cheerful um, disposable clothing. Um, sometimes people do buy it for only to be worn one time, so it's almost like a single-use plastic item. And there's like new drops literally every day. So people can go online every day, even to the same um, brand or retailer and find newness every single day where it used to be, you know, a couple of seasons a year or more of a, a season. Um, it's now seasonless. Wow. OK, so um, what do you think is behind the growth in fast fashion? It's an incredibly slick marketing machine, I think, in terms of um, the website experience, the speed and the um, accuracy of the delivery, um, the reliability of the delivery, and also the social media marketing and influencers that are behind that, that encourage us to buy things and show these garments in their best light and kind of feed that frenzy and, and create that excitement. Would you say that social media has had quite a significant role to play in its in the growth of fast fashion? I'm thinking of sort of taking the shopping experience out of shops, out mm. of uh, the nine to five window and moving it into just sitting on the sofa at the end of the day, yeah, scrolling. Yeah, because you can just sit watching TV or even in bed. I mean, people are spending a lot now just kind of before they drift off to sleep um, because it's now accessible 24 hours a day. And people don't want to be seen in the same outfit more than once because they're constantly posting photos on social media. So it's almost like it plays into this need we have for um, individuality and status and, and promoting that, the online life, as it were, the social Instagram persona. Yeah, and that kind of um, novelty. So especially if you're using garments, not particularly to, to wear out, but just to be photographed in, then you don't need to wear them again and you probably don't want to wear them again. OK, so we're used to online brands leading fast fashion, but are high street stores also getting in on the act, do you think? Yeah, I think they're having to, to be able to compete because, you know, they can't lag behind. They can't be seen to just be having kind of newness in their store you know once a month or once a week they need to be having um you know new items to buy every day as well and it is impulse purchasing that these companies rely on isn't it because we don't need any more mm -hmm. new clothing um but if you can get consumers to buy something purely because they like it and they want it there and then then that's a good business model and it's a revenue stream so do you think fast fashion has made fashion more accessible to more people? And do you think we're shopping more as a result? Yes, I, I really do think so. So it has brought style <coughs> to the masses. Um, we can all indulge in brand new garments at you know very, very low prices, not much more than a coffee and a sandwich. Um, and you know it's fun to experiment with different looks and try and recreate your favorite celebrity style. Um, and also be able to wear different things every day. And it's made it more accessible to people that have a lower income as well. So, you know, maybe they couldn't have new clothes before, they were buying second hand, and now they are actually being able to go into the shops and buy things that at a time were very aspirational. And now they can, you know, they can go out and buy and be like everyone else. What could be better than getting a brand new outfit at a low price in 24 hours? but obviously um, there's a cost. So um, Patsy, you specialise in the environmental cost of fast fashion. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, the increasing volumes of production that are being made because of the growth of fast fashion and it's growing all over the world. So not just in <coughs> Western countries, but also in developing emerging economies where populations are growing and um, they're going through periods of economic development, so people have money to spend. So there are huge swathes of population that want to buy into this now. So the great volume of stuff that is being produced and then being disposed of very rapidly because it's not worn or kept for very long, then it is leading to a massive waste of resources, pollution and increasing volumes of textile waste predominantly going to landfill. 
Um, what are the biggest concerns? Is it the production side of the operation or the waste that results from it? Um, oh, it's kind of both areas really are very closely connected. So the production <coughs> is very energy intensive, uses a lot of chemicals and lots of waters, um, predominantly synthetic fabrics now, which don't biodegrade. Um, and because of you know the, the trend of wearing things and not keeping them, and how people dispose of them. So we don't really have a closed loop garment to garment recycling system, but mostly everything is binned when it's not desired anymore. So I suppose um, it's like we're, we're more aware now of plastic bag use and we use bags for life, but someone might not think that when they just throw out an outfit, it's actually gonna take the same amount of time to break down, as in it won't. Yeah, absolutely. And because they've made a similar thing, synthetic, so it all comes from the same source, petrochemicals, and it's all going back into the environment, isn't it? So we're becoming more conscious about plastic use, but we need to translate that into garment use as well. So 2019 could be seen um, as the year that people really woke up to the reality of climate change. But do you think that consumers are aware of how damaging fast fashion is to the environment? I think we are becoming increasingly aware. So we've seen a lot more in the news, um, a lot more celebrity um, and influential people are talking about this. And also lots of brands, both online and on the high street, are you know showcasing various initiatives that they're doing. So people are waking up to it. I think we can agree that we're becoming people are becoming a little more familiar with the environmental impact of um, fast fashion, but there is another dark side to it that people might not be aware of, which brings us to your research, Amy. If you could um, tell us a little bit about that. Um, yeah, I mean, fashion has a social cost. Um, it's a very labour-intensive industry, which has meant. Um, that production moved offshore so when you think about how we used to have a lot of production in the UK um, and then it moved to the Far East because it was cheaper and it's always moving around looking for that cheaper option because there's obviously is, um, to be able to charge um, low prices in, in the shop then you know the cost has to come from somewhere and, and because it's a, a labour intensive industry then they'll often look for a, a low cost um, labour country um, so there's that social cost where people are suffering and people often don't associate that with their clothes. I think they're becoming more aware of maybe the environmental side, um, but they aren't thinking actually who made my clothes. Um, and that's the real issue at the moment that people are being exploited to make cheap fast fashion. And you mentioned how this began when um, more and more manufacturing was taken mm -hmm. offshore. Um, to bring down the cost of production. But obviously with fast fashion, this isn't something that's just happening overseas anymore. No, so it's happening here in the UK and that's often quite surprising for people because they think that you know, it won't be happening in the UK. But obviously if you want speed, like you said, then um, we found that production is becoming to come back to the UK. There's certain hubs, um, there's lots of production happening in Leicester, for example, and obviously you've got higher costs in the UK, so something's got to give. And it's people that aren't being paid the minimum wage, for example, working very long hours. Um, it's a very complex issue as well. And companies are quite nervous about producing in the UK as well because they want the speed, but then there's also the exploitation that's taking place. But a lot of the brands and retailers are also aware that this is happening and they are joining a lot of initiatives to see what can actually be done in the UK to improve the situation. And then what sort of initiatives are those? A lot of the brands are doing things themselves as well and, and visiting the factories um, on a regular basis. But there's just hundreds and hundreds of uh, factories and subcontracting, which again is another issue in the industry so a retailer or brand will place an order with a factory and this could be a factory that they visited and that they've audited and then made sure it's okay but then the order won't actually be made there it will be subcontracted to another unit that isn't compliant and it's so difficult to actually have visibility of where your product's being made and this happens in in every country that production is happening so you mentioned earlier that um, you think this side is something that consumers 
probably aren't aware of when they think about where their clothes have come from. Um, but do you think that if they did know, it would alter their spending habits? There are more sustainable brands um, available, and probably more now than ever. But it's quite difficult. I mean, a lot of them are a lot a higher price point, um, so that's not necessarily accessible for everyone. I think there's still a lot of confusion as well, like Patsy said, amongst consumers, and they're not really sure what they should be buying or what the best option is. And they don't necessarily, the more sustainable brands have like a really wide offer. So you might not necessarily be able to find the exact item that you need. Do you think that influencers, social media influencers and brand ambassadors have a duty to take more responsibility over what they promote? Mm, interesting. Mm. I, I think so. And it's kind of coming into um, regulations now, hasn't it? And there is more of a debate about this. Um, we're seeing it around that you're not allowed to promote things like, um, you know, diet pills and stuff on Instagram. That's been all shut down, hasn't it? So I think we are questioning now the, the right of people just to promote anything willy nilly to a big audience of people that are quite um, susceptible to following what they say just for them to make money off of it. And um, can the environment ever take priority over consumerism? And what do you think would need to change for this to happen? I think we'd need to see much more of the effects on our own territory, whereas at the moment we're quite far removed. So probably most people haven't even been to a landfill site. Certainly nobody um, you know, in this country would have probably seen a polluted river or you know, seen the after effects of um, chemicals being sprayed on you know, children that are born in that community and so on. So it's, it's really difficult to imagine because we don't see the effects of it here. Hopefully we won't ever see that, but I'm sure you know, if we carry on the way we're going, it, there could come a day where that happens everywhere. Which brings me to my last question. We've seen fast fashion really explode almost out of nowhere due to a number of different factors that we've addressed. But what do you think the future holds now for the fashion industry? Yeah, there's lots more options now, isn't there? But there's also lots more innovations and, and different fibres, um, you know, non-traditional fibres, like fibres made from waste materials like ocean plastic waste or... Um, you know, vegetable waste and biofibres and so on, all of that's coming along, isn't it? And there's fashion designers emerging from all parts of the world. So I think it's a really interesting time. And we need to think about, you know, what fashion is to us. And when you're young, it means something different from when you get older. And I think as you get older and you become more aware of the problems that it causes, you become more conscious. But it's, it's hard when you're a young person, you don't really know about everything at that stage or for example if you've worked in the industry or you've researched the industry you have a much greater awareness than the average consumer would have but still when when we go into a shop you know you can't say you know that item's better option than that item it's really difficult and there are more sustainable brands um being introduced as well so i think there are more options available i think you know, companies in general, brands and retailers, you know, the, the big brands and retailers are becoming a lot more transparent. They're having to publish modern slavery statements. There is a lot more information being made available to the consumer. I don't think we're necessarily at the stage yet where all consumers are kind of actively going out to find this information. And it definitely needs to become a lot more easier and accessible for, for consumers to know kind of what is right and what's kind of the, the better product to buy. So we're not quite there yet. Do you think... Um policy change is needed from from the government to make this move a little bit faster i think that's the only thing that would make things speed up um, but it's a difficult one isn't it because you want to protect the industry at the same time which is a big employer and a mm. massive contributor to the economy and our culture and our lifestyle and so on so it's not it's not easy but if it was um more, if there are easier options, for example, you know, people could easier access repair services or repair cafes or, you know, easily find things that were made from recycled materials or even access rental services at a reasonable price. But at the moment, that's not really there in the environment. Or teaching, in, sorry, teaching textiles in schools so that actually everyone knows how to sew and how to mend and then they can actually have that longevity when they buy something. And you both teach young people, you both teach um, fashion, business fashion marketing students. 
do you think there's going to be or are you seeing more of a um, move towards shopping at charity shops clothes swaps make do and mend mentality among young young people I think we've always had that in um, this part of the world. I think we've kind of grown up on vintage and all of that stuff from the 1970s and so on. Um, so our students, they are quite keen on um, you know, alternative sources of fashion and style, but it's not for everyone. So um, I think we have to be mindful that, that you know, hygiene, cleanliness and so on and garments um, do degrade over time and they do get dirty uh, worn out smelly and so on so there is a limit to what you can buy second hand but I think um, nowadays with fast fashion people are actually donating goods to charity shops that haven't ever been worn so you can actually go charity shopping and pick a few bargains which are absolutely brand new with the labels still on. I think students are becoming a lot more aware and a lot more inquisitive and, and questioning um, you know what's going on and this the sustainability side um, they do projects in their final year when they set up their own business and a lot of those are um, sustainable businesses so I think you know they are becoming a lot more and I think when they're actually going out into employment as well I think they're actually more conscious about who they're going to work for. We've heard how Manchester has been at the forefront of textiles and later fashion for more than a century. Today, the city's home to some of the country's best-known fashion brands, offering cheap and on-trend clothing from online basket to your door in a matter of hours. But if something seems too good to be true, it probably is. And as we've heard, the fashion industry has a dark side. So what does the future hold? What questions should we be asking of our favourite brands and shops? I spoke to Rachel Cox, a recent fashion business graduate, about how consumers can help change the industry. So Rachel, Christmas is over and we all probably have at least one outfit hanging in our wardrobe that we will never wear ever again. But it's also a new year and people want to better themselves. So with that in mind, what's your New Year's resolution? Good question to start. So the one that I'm going to continue that I've done for about probably since I've actually started university or, well, you know, when I started, um, is boycott most high street stores. Now, at the end of the day, there are some that I do think are better than others, but just as much as you can where you don't know, the idea is if you can boycott mass manufacturing where there is a high throughput, actually that is not a bad way to start. Um, and also just repair and protect, because one thing, um, um, I've been a textile student, but I haven't actually learned because it was more the business side. It wasn't a lot of sort of basic sort of repair and protect skills I'd like to sort of get back doing some of that just so I can you know there's a lot of things that I loved wearing and that I realized this may be slightly broken I thought I can't there's no point in chucking it out so just to maintain them I think and keep on top of it. So when you're thinking about boycotting um, certain high, high street brands mm. what are you looking for what is it that will make you say that's it, um, you're not getting any more of my money. I think it's any research that I've done on the brands in the first place and or that um, they've maybe potentially greenwashed, um, which is basically where they do, they try to sort of put um, environmental and social messages out there, but it might they might be then exposed to slave labour or some somehow down the supply chain, um, you know, um, environmental problems. Um, I think the the best thing to do when I, personally when I've done it is look at them and see when you look at the stores and you go in if there is so many rails and so many just things around it can be too way too good to be true that they have ethics and it, it's really difficult because honestly just by me saying I boycott places it's like it's not just as simple as that but I know that by boycotting a lot of big high street chains it can at least sort of it's one way of stopping supporting it. So if it seems too good to be true, it yeah. probably is. Basically, and yeah. You're asking what's the catch. Exactly. And I think there is some sort of morale as well in actually, you, you know, there are, there's, there's charity shops, there's thrift shops, there are local, um, you know, suppliers to places that are affordable. You have to look for them a lot of the time, but they are affordable. And actually, I think it's, it's, it's doable, you just have to make that commitment as much as possible. And if you are used to shopping somewhere because of a certain style or a certain thing, you just you the best thing to do, honestly, is just have a look elsewhere because the amount of... I think the thing is, as well, the amount of second-hand stores there are around as well, it's easy to find something very similar to what you usually would want anyway. 
So you mentioned um, a certain high street brands greenwashing before, perhaps to sort of jump on the green trend. Um, what do you think the fashion industry should really be making its New Year's resolution? So I think one of the main things they should be doing is talking to each other, um, high street brand, high street brand, and also talking to other fashion companies, you know, within the luxury sector or even with, the th you know, with the thrift shops themselves and see what sort of schemes they run and just have the more collaboration I think we have, the better, because actually if people are taught, the problem is I think people don't talk to each other enough and actually also have different companies, not just fashion companies, but have, you know, play companies in the food industry, you know, um, loads of just individual companies, even marketing companies, it would be really helpful if everyone just started collaborating more and talking more, because actually it's good to have different ideas. It might not always work in a certain area or with certain brands, but actually by having that idea in the first place, it's like, well, where can we take this? And the conversation's been made at least. So I think that's one thing. Um, and the other sort of link into that is future strategies because at the end of the day, I think there's so many discussions that happen and actually th since there's so many people and myself always say actually the fast fashion model isn't whether you have different types of materials, this, that or the other, it's not sustainable, the actual model and because of the throughput and the idea of the businesses churning so many clothes and products out and yet consumers potentially throwing them away at such a fast rate the model is just completely unsustainable anyway so actually by having like ha by having these businesses having the conversations um to look at um future strategies that will look at long-term um strategies in terms of like minimizing the impact um on you know socially and environmentally i think that's another thing they can do so we've heard that um, the materials used, the manufacturing techniques used by the fast fashion industry are um, incredibly harmful to the environment and that in order to make that model work, there is a reliance, not, not by every brand, not in every quarter, but by some on slave labour. Mm. So you're, you're looking at an even bigger picture at completely overhauling the entire fast fashion yeah. model and <laughs> saying that the current model doesn't work can can you explain a little bit more about why you think that model isn't working I think because the, it just causes so much inequality obviously I think the idea of being able to afford amazing clothing at these low prices um, and um, and own so much of it as well it makes us think we're very rich and actually there is someone always losing out so um you're a fashion business graduate, so you're looking at it uh, very much with um, an expert's eye. But you're also a shopper. You buy clothes yep. and you follow trends. So as a consumer, what power do you think we have to change the industry? So I think, um, honestly, one of the things that I definitely, because I've never actually, I mean, I do, I've followed trends before. But one thing that I've found that I've always loved doing as a kid is just buy purely being yourself if you want to follow trends great that's fine but just you know I think just honestly consuming less and then when you find a, some when you find something you want to buy just make sure you absolutely love it because and if you love it you know you will wear it a lot so coming back to something you said just before about making the most of what you buy and um really thinking about if you want it when when it comes to fast fashion how do you think we really can get the most out of those clothes? Uh, clothing that often isn't designed or made to last. So that actually there's a, there's a good concept um, that's kind of around at the moment and it's wear it 30 times at least before you either sort of get rid of it or you pass it on or something like that. But actually I think personally that should be more at the end of the day, but it's a good concept to start with. It's like, are you going to wear it at least 30 times? And then if you know... If you know you're not, then obviously question why you're going to buy it. And if you know you are, but that's it, then think, right, what can I do with it afterwards? You know, don't just throw it away, you know, recycle it, reuse it, give, let somebody borrow it, change it yourself, learn how to sort of alter them, um, which brings you on to another point about sort of protecting and repairing um, items of clothing or accessories, because actually that's one thing that I think we're just not taught to do anymore is actually how to fix things. Um, and actually it's... W w like I said before, why would you want to um, 
why would you want to get rid of something you absolutely love even if it is a bit broken you know if you can repair it um i think material consideration is a good point now this is obviously a huge debate at the moment because of the plastics and with polyester and other synthetic fibers um and obviously cotton has been brought out as being quite a very unsustainable um material but again i think it's about it's it's obviously there's a material process and there's also the actual process of what the sort of the material management afterwards and beforehand so actually i would i would argue at the end of the day synthetic fibers are probably overall worse but at the same time it depend again it depends how you use it and what you buy in it um and how you care for it as well so it, it that's one thing to consider but it is a big um, topic that as well and also thinking about outfit variations so when you do actually buy something think you know I'm not saying for people to go for really sort of bland things and to be able to have to match everything but think would you wear things with you know how many variations can you make out of your wardrobe and if you can then great there's nothing wrong with that um, I think one of the things as well that, I, that that's a good tip is that I think we feel like we have to wash and launder clothing. Obviously, it depends on the person and how you feel, but you really don't have to launder as clothes as much as people think you do. Um, for example, jeans, you can get away for months without actually washing them properly, um, with obviously give, give or take the reason. Um, but they, if you look after them, they can actually be kept well. And so what, what's the problem with overwashing our clothes? So overwashing basically um, encourages um, microfibers to escape, which are basically the small fibers you get in any material, especially with um, synthetic materials and plastics. They are obviously small particles of plastic and they can get into the waterways through your washing machine. And the difficult thing is as well, if you do have, I think there's a lot of like um, laundry bags that you can put your washing in that collect the fibres. And there's been a huge argument recently of, well, if you're just going to collect the fibres and put them in the bin, isn't that just as bad as letting them go out into the waterway? And that's also what's considered as what, you know, we've spoken about greenwashing. So that's it's a very difficult thing to sort of know from a consumer's perspective where... That what they can do about that and actually I think that's where if you do feel like you can just sort of hold off from too much laundry it does it will make a difference you might not feel like it is overall but if everybody's doing it then it will so the the primary consumer base for fast fashion markets uh, is young people on a low income but with few financial commitments um, people who follow trends people who are social media savvy the industry banks on these shoppers putting their desire for the latest styles, for the latest trends above the environmental impact, above the people cost. But do you think that this thinking is a little dismissive? Um, the Extinction Rebellion was spearheaded by young people. Do, the, do these brands need to wake up and see that this is actually something that matters to young people more than just having the latest outfit? Absolutely, it is dismissive because, again, it's, it's the young people's futures, it's our futures that actually we know are coming, you know, shorter and shorter to an end if this doesn't get sorted out. So I think it is, and... <sighs> Just because they're well, just because we're obviously young doesn't mean we have we don't have a valid opinion. At the end of the day, we have you don't have to have a full you know fifty years of experience to you know suddenly realise hey something's something around the planet is not happening that's great at all you know. But yeah, no, I think it's really dismissive just to generally say that young people like just prioritise fashion and trends and that's it. And I, I don't think. I don't think they do at all. I think now they have a lot of people have actually seen the impact and they realise, you know, the huge impact that this has. I think they do want to make a difference. It's just finding the opportunity to be able to make a difference that's also not absolutely exhausting to them um, and without obviously impacting on them too much because um, it isn't easy at the end of the day. It's not. That's all for this episode of The Buzz, and if you're still thinking of a New Year's resolution, your wardrobe might be a good place to start. We'll be back with a new episode soon, delving into another science and engineering subject. We hope you've enjoyed what you've heard, and if you have any suggestions or requests for future podcasts, or if you'd like to comment on anything we've covered, then please get in touch. Our email is fsemarketing at manchester.ac.uk. And you can follow the faculty on Instagram and Twitter at UOMSCIENG. We also have a Facebook page and YouTube account. 
Links to all our social media can be found on our website at manchester.ac.uk forward slash the buzz, along with further information on what you've heard today. So feel free to get in touch, but if you'd prefer to just listen, that's great too. Subscribe to the podcast via iTunes or your usual podcast supplier and give us a like or even a review. We'll see you next time. Thank you.